Welcome everyone. My name is Allison Heaney, Vice President of Learning and Public Programming at the Museum of Latin American Art. Joining me is Soli Marsalis, Vice President of Content, Innovation and Outreach. We welcome you today, Wednesday, December 14th, 2022, to this edition of the MOLA Zoom Project in conversation with the artist Oscar Castillo, where MOLA Chief Curator Gabriel Urtiaga will discuss with the artist his work and career. This special chapter was pre-recorded in the artist studio in Whittier, California, and will be uploaded to the MOLA YouTube channel and archive. MOLA acknowledges the support of the Genesis Inspiration Foundation, the Miller Foundation, the Dwight Stewart Youth Fund, and the Arts Council for Long Beach for their constant support of the educational initiatives at the Museum of Latin American Art. A special thanks also to the California Arts Council Art Exposure Grant. Each chapter of the MOLA Zoom projects features a conversation between the most remarkable artists from Latin America and Latinx artists from the US and our chief curator. Together, we focus on a series of specific artworks which require close inspection, a deliberate process of contemplation and exploration, and delving into the ideas surrounding the creation of works, their sources of research and inspiration in an effort to immerse ourselves in the world of the artists. In chapter 28 of the MOLA Zoom project, we are joined by multidisciplinary Oscar Castillo, who is best known for his emphasis on photography as art. After high school, Castillo served four years in the US Marine Corps, of which one year was spent in Japan. After following his discharge, he enrolled in college with a dual major of sociology and fine arts. While in Japan during the mid 1960s, he was very influenced by the cultural and environmental beauty of that country and began a serious study of photography to document his experiences while there. This fascination with cultural, social, and political documentation has continued to this day with his personal artist at photography re reflecting his sense of community. As youth, his parents influenced him in a way his mother kept a family photo album. As Castillo explains, these are not just snapshots, but rather a medium that tells a story by the choice of location, as well as by depicting different people. In more than 30 years that Castillo has been producing art images, there are cycles of recurring themes and a metamorphosis of images and ideas. Some pieces are standalone images, while in others, he combines photos into juxtaposed or organically combined collages. While some are photojournalistic, others are painterly. But as we will discover, many carry on his early memories of community, family, and a sense of place, reflecting his Hispanic and Native American heritage, while at the same time making a universal statement. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today in this special program of the MOLA Zoom Project. And now, let's visit the artist studio. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today and we will have the great opportunity and honor to talk with the great Chicano artist and photographer Oscar Castillo. He is ready to have an amazing conversation with all of us in his home and studio. Oscar, uh, you have been involved in creating visual art uh, that interpret the contemporary urban Chicano culture in LA, but also different important events around the world. But tell us about your influential, uh, important situation that you live in different moments of your life. And tell us also about your beginning as a photographer. Okay. Well, um, Gabriela, thank you for for visiting me here at home and having a chance to talk about my work. But uh, uh, in answer to your question, I'm originally born in El Paso, Texas, and my influence was very early in my age with photography. My parents both enjoyed photography, and I have I still keep many of the images that they took. I have albums from the family, and one of the well, one of the pictures I'm going to show you. Uh, later is of a family picture but it's later on in life but uh i always enjoyed as a youth looking at those albums because we didn't have television but we always enjoyed going to the movies the theater and we will watch different movies like i remember 
Fantasia. So I was always visually influenced by by visuals. And I would look at magazines every every week or every month. We would get, at the time it was Time Magazine and Life Magazine. And of course we were always uh, very active in our family. Our family was very close and we always was, were interacting with our aunts and our uncles and our cousins. And I always, I grew up speaking English and Spanish. My my grandparents all spoke Spanish to me and even to the, you know, all my life they always spoke Spanish to me. And my mother and my father always spoke English, although my mother spoke a lot of Spanish too. So I'm I'm fortunate in that I was able to, to enjoy both cultures. And since we li lived in El Paso, oh, uh, Ciudad Juarez was right across the border, so we we're very actively going into Juarez. So I experienced the Mexican culture, and of course the American culture in 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 Texas. So uh, I I always enjoyed photography, and I didn't really get my own camera till I was in in high school, and I got a little, which was then uh, it's a point and shoot camera by Kodak. It was called Instamatic. And so I like to take pictures and uh, not that many, but I did develop an interest. And then when I was in the Marine Corps, I was drafted to go in the service when I was just out of high school. I was attending college, but I didn't think to apply for a, a uh, exemption because as a student, you didn't apply for it. But anyway, I was, uh, I was gonna be drafted and I joined the Marine Corps. And I went, I was, I think the best part of the Marine Corps is that I got to go to Japan for a year. And I got to go over there and I was very impressed with all the culture, the way the Japanese, the architecture, the art, the, the, the landscapes. And I was, I used that as a, as a hobby other than, you know, if I wasn't at work, then I, I would take my camera and I'd go out in the community and I'd take pictures of, of, uh, of Japanese uh, culture, you know, the, their temples, their kimonos, the children in school, and I still have that. So I, I developed a sense of, of interest in, in community. Of course, that kind of went along with my, in, my community as a youth and in my family. So that was an extension of, of, of that. And, um, and then later on, when I came back from the service, I went to college, I went back to college and I decided to, to, to continue my photography interest. And um, so I, um, one of my professors saw that I was a good photographer and uh, his name was Dr. Rudy Acuna. Mm -hmm. And I was very active with the, the, the social movement at the time, which was the Chicano movement, the Chicano um, protest against the Vietnam War. And, and, and the school walkouts uh, in East Los Angeles, because at the time I was living in, in California by then. So uh, I became very active because just my own personal interests. And I, anywhere I would go, I would have my camera with me and take pictures of all the events. And so I developed a style and a, and a way of a vision of how I would, in my photographs, I would, you, I like to think of myself as an artist. I'm not a photo photojournalist, but I think that if I need to do for photojournalism for some reason, I, I can do that. But I also, in my photojournalism, I think you can see a, um, a, an influence of, of art, my artistic training, which I like to say because I also ma I majored in art with photography as a, uh, as a uh, emphasis. Exactly, Oscar, and that you mentioned you are an artistic photographer, but also a photojournalist. And when you are creating your picture, uh, what is uh, your creative process? Well, that's I do. I do tend to. I don't just walk up to something and take a picture. I do study it. I study it from a composition point of view, and and when I shoot something, I maybe some consciously because I, you know, I, I tend to create images that, that reflect an artistic eye. And even though like when I was doing a lot of photo photographs of, of Cesar Chavez and the farm workers, I think that you, what you see 
and those could be considered uh, more, perhaps more um, photojournalistic documentation, mm -hmm. but also artistic because if you look at my work, you will, it's not just a picture of somebody standing there. There's a composition because I, you know, I like to say that I was influenced by uh, art art masters of whether they're European or or, or Latin from Latin America. I studied uh, you know painters. I studied uh, sculptures. I studied other photographers. For instance, I studied and I love the work of Manuel Alvaro Bravo. Mm -hmm. Manuel Bravo. Bravo. Yeah. And and I always enjoyed the the cinema of uh, Gabriel Figueroa, mm -hmm. as well as I like the European uh, cinematographers. Uh, um, that name escapes me. Uh, uh, well, a, a Mexican cinematographer or mm -hmm. Buñuel. Buñuel. Luis Buñuel. Buñuel. And in Japan, we have uh, we have uh, Kira Kurosawa. Oh yes. And so so all of that. I absorb and I use it in my in my style and in my way of seeing. Mm -hmm. So I love the, all of that, and I like, you know, I like. Even though um, there's there's many 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 photographers that, that that influence me, whether directly or indirectly. But and then I, in terms of photojournalism, I think that maybe the most in, influential would be Gordon Parks. He was a very well known black photographer. He shot for uh, for. Uh, Life magazine, and he's very famous, and he, he even has a foundation uh, in his name. So he has a, he's very well known, and uh, also um, there was a, a, a lady photographer who, who who documented the 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 farm workers, the um, the oh, from Oklahoma during the the Dust Bowl, how they migrated west, and they and and there's a she uh, Dorothea Lang is her name. But I'm also influenced by, by literary writers. I, I, I enjoy working with writers because I like the way they, they basically they paint a picture with their words. And so I like to think of my work as visual poems or visual stories because it's, they say it's said that a picture says a thousand words. So I think that I enjoy that, that saying because I, I put a lot into my work and it could be you know, made into stories. Yeah, this is amazing, Oscar, because <laughs> you, your picture reflects your knowledge about culture, about art, about history. And also, uh, you told me that you work in a dark room, but also now you are more familiar with the digital process. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yes, well, when I was, I didn't learn the dark room until I was in college. I was taking photography. So we needed to learn how to develop our own film. And of course, in film cameras, you, it's different than analog because you have to load the film. You have to you know, make a selection of the film, whether it's black and white, whether it's color, whether it's color slides. And then you have to physically load your camera and then shoot the pictures. And then after, afterwards, you unload the camera and in my case, uh, I learned to develop black and white print, uh, film. And then from that, and you, do use, you use chemicals. And then after you develop it, then you have to print it using a dark room, which is again, it's called the wet process where you, you develop it under a, an enlarger and then you have to put it in chemicals to develop it. And then you need to dry it. And, and you have, a, you have a, a, a kind of, we have a, um, a process, I call it a process, and then of course, then you you frame them and you exhibit them, or if you're lucky enough, you sell them or you have them published. But then um, that is, uh, that requires a totally dark environment. All you have is safe lights. But in digital, digital, I, I I didn't switch to digital till maybe 20 years ago because I was working I was working locally at a city as a photographer and they wanted to go paperless. So I was always shooting film and they wanted to cut back expenses and rather than have my film developed and printed and then used for publication, they said, we're going paperless. And that meant, you know, the city council, the agendas, everything was digital. Everyone was going with uh, computers. So I decided to take classes in, in digital photography. So I took classes. At, at, you know, a number of semesters in digital photography and, and art in the art department. So 
it was a new world for me. I, I had, of course, the camera usage is very similar, but the difference is that you don't have to develop it. You have it in a digital format, and then you load it in a computer. But there's that process is slightly different, although many people print directly out of the camera. But in my because of my background and because I, I want to make it special, I, I still take the photograph and I and I manipulate it or I enhance it and I change the co contrast, the, the hues, the you know, the the uh, what else? The saturation. Yeah. I can either make it, you know, more the way I like it, the way I see it. So it's much different and, and you don't have to be in a dark room. You can be printing and then you can get up and have, get a cup of coffee, come back. <laughs> and then also the printing. The printing is very exciting. And I have my own printers here and I print I print my images. And, and again, it's similar to printing in a dark room, but uh, it's you don't have to have chemicals. You don't have to dry it. Although you, when you print digitally, the ink is on the paper and it has to dry. Uh, you know, till so before you handle it, mm -hmm. and uh, I use uh, archival ink so that the longevity of the print, according to tests, could, could be 300 years or, or more if you use good quality paper and archival ink. But uh, uh, in some cases, if the image is too large, then I send it out to labs that I trust, and, and they can print it on canvas. They can print all, all their, you know, uh, on fine art paper. I mean, I can do that too. I can print on watercolor paper. And, uh, and, and anyway, um, I have, I've been fortunate to start working with museums and they have accepted um, archival pigment prints is what they're called as, as, as archival for use in their museums. So I have had, I've worked with uh, locally, the what's called Latino Museum of Art and History, which was downtown for a while. I worked with UCLA, and we've created an, a, um, and this is digital now from my archives. Are Some were negatives, and but UCLA got a, a grant from the Getty, mm -hmm. and they developed an, an archive of my work, and we digitized about 4,000 images. So they can be used by students and scholars for for academic research or for you know for publication and um, i'm very fortunate in that i worked with chon noriega who was the director at the time yeah. and uh, and then he had staff that that helped me we worked on it for about four years and then um, i worked with um, at the latino museum of, of culture and art or history that i worked very closely with uh, the director uh, denise uh, lugo she was very 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 qualified uh, director and I, I loved working with her and I still work with her at at Cal State University Channel Islands we've done a couple of exhibits there but anyway I, I, what I was saying I don't want to get off track but the difference um, digital is, per, is pretty much exclusive what I shoot now I shoot film occasionally just to, just as a kind of a um, so I don't forget, you know, film. Film is very important to me. Mm -hmm. And I do, even if I shoot film, I probably have it digitized and I print it uh, with contemporary uh, um, uh, method. So uh, all my images, I, as I said, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but at UCLA, all the, the 4,000 images, all of which were film, were digitized and, and are in the library uh, digitally. Okay. So anyway. Um, but over that time, um, I've, I've been very fortunate to be published in many publications and in be, my work has been used in films and videos, documentaries. And um, I think, and I don't know if I mentioned, but the Smithsonian also has acquired some of my work, some of my historical work, which include work of uh, the documenting Cesar Chavez and, and much of the, the Chicano uh, activism that has taken place over the and I one semester I, wor I worked at in, in Texas and I lived at a farm worker community and I shot many many photographs and uh, and I, those have been used in books and and uh, documentaries also so and of course I can't 
I can't exclude my family. My family are always, I'm always taking pictures of my family and, and my friends. And, uh, and so that's, again, it's a, my family and my, and my friends all kind of become one big, <laughs> one big group. So it's hard to, and I work very closely with a lot of artists. So uh, I, I, um, I've been very blessed to, to have that kind of a working relationship with artists and musicians and, and people like yourself, museums and, and, uh, and documentary workers. But it's interesting because a lot of times, one of my ways of working with photography is I'll take my camera and I'll just, like I used to do in Japan, I go in the community and I take pictures. Well, it's not different here. I'll go out in the community and I'll find a community and I'll just walk around and take pictures and I, I document, I capture images which reflect that community. And um, so it's, it's very rewarding. Of course, now with the pandemic, it's not so much fun because, you know, it's, it's a little different. So, so I spend a lot of time in my yard and I take pictures of my plants and, you know, still lives. I like still lives and landscapes. <laughs> So fantastic, Oscar. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are ready to uh, put the focus and analyze in some of your most important pictures during the last decade. And we would like to start in your period in Japan. Okay. If you can talk about that experience, and also we will show the, the picture that you select for this conversation. Okay. Well, it was very difficult. It was very a challenge to me to select six or seven images, as I mentioned, because out of the hundreds, if not thousands of images, it's hard to say, well, this, this, this is an example of, of this area. So I, I, I kind of, I was able to do that. And for instance, the first picture that I, rec that I, that I submitted was a photograph I took in downtown Tokyo in, in Japan. And it, what I love about it is that it was at night and it was raining and in Tokyo, there's so many neon lights. So it, to me, it became like an impressionistic kind of painting from, you know, the impressionist painters in, in Europe. It, it reminded me of something like that. And so I photographed it. And what, another interesting about it is not just the city at night, but it, since it's raining, you have the, the, the street is covered in water. So you have a reflection of all the lights and that becomes even uh, more impressionistic. So I loved, you know, I love taking pictures of landscapes. And this one of Japan is one of my favorites, the one at night in, in Tokyo in, near the, the Ginza. Mm -hmm. So I, I was stationed, I was in Japan for 13 months, but I would go to, I got to go to Tokyo a couple of times in Okinawa. But this, this image, and even though you can't read what the signs say, it doesn't matter because it, it goes along with, with the, the the, the image and it, it just becomes I actually one time I painted this for a <laughs> class I was taking in, in painting at Cal State Northridge but I loaned it to a friend of mine and he had it in storage and and somehow he didn't pay the rent on the storage so the painting disappeared so so <laughs> so I made a, a paint I, I made a large size print of it which was similar to the painting but um, but I still have, you know, I have a lot of um, images from Japan, uh, both on the base of, of my, you know, my, my fellow Marines, you know, we, we would take pictures of portraits and then uh, of, of many, many more of the, um, the, the Japanese, uh, the city outside of our base, which is Iwakuni, Iwakuni, Japan. Mm -hmm. And they're, they, I would like to go visit their, their castles. They have medieval castles because that was when, the uh, the Japanese had their feudal um, their feudal kings or mm -hmm. uh, the samurai and all that kind of stuff, but it's uh, it's very unique to Japan and and it was a very enjoyable part of my my uh, my visit or my the the 60s that was in the 60s and then I came back and in college I started getting involved with the the student move the student movement and I, as I say I was very active and that became more um, documenting social protests and cultural events so it wasn't so much the the um, the um, 
the urban scapes per se, mm -hmm. but but in some of in some of the protests you can see the environment. So you know, I always like to include not only just people, but I like the, the environment that they're in and and the times. So does so that kind of answer your question? Yes, okay. fantastic. Okay, Oscar, and we would like to put the focus in some of your important pictures, especially in the 70s, that um, you create and you uh, be part of that, uh, Las Adelitas from 1970s at the Chicano Moratorium, and you reflect the power uh, of the activist Chicana woman. Tell us about that and, and the, the primary idea behind this powerful uh, picture. Okay, well, during the 70s, um, there were a series of, of protest marches that were organized by various uh, um, student groups and, and uh, social uh, activist groups. And there was a series uh, called the uh, Chicano Moratorium. And this was, Throughout the United States, there was moratoriums against the, the war, the Vietnam War. But the, in L.A. and in certain cities of the Southwest, Texas and and uh, and uh, I think New Mexico. Anyway, there was groups called uh, there were the, the moratorium committees, moratorium against the Vietnam War. And here in Los Angeles, there was uh, there was uh, a, a number of of uh, marches which were designed to bring attention to to um, uh, people or activists um, concern about continued participating in the Vietnam War and the the biggest one that historically that happened was uh, in August uh, 29th of 1970 and and it was in in East Los Angeles and it had approximately over 20,000 participants. I don't remember exactly, but there was mm -hmm. 20,000 or, or more, maybe 30,000. But they marched from what's now the, well, what's Belvedere Park, which is now the the um, civic center of the East Los Angeles. I mean, that's where they have the library and government offices and a very beautiful park. But anyway, they started there and it marched all the way to, at the time was called Laguna Park. And it was, it was, uh, I was there photographing it because I was, you know, I was involved, not organizing. I was not an organizer by any chance, by any means, but I was there to document it for my own personal reasons. I wasn't doing it. Nobody asked me to do it, but I, I had a, I felt I needed, I had a commitment to document these events. So the particular image we're talking about is one of my, one of my favorites. I. I don't, because there was one prior to the August one, it was called the Moratorium in the Rain. And that's that's where this image came, and that was in February of 70. And the, there was a group called the uh, the Brown Berets, and they were similar to, the black community had the Black Panthers. So the, the Chicano community formed a, a group called the Brown Berets, and they all dressed in paramilitary clothing and they wore brown beret so that was their uh, means of identification and of course many women joined the group also but at some point the women decided this was during the time of the feminist movement and you know, also the, so there's two movements going parallel to each other the, the Chicano movement and the feminist movement I, and I can't speak for them because I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a woman obviously but I, I support them and I, I always um, admired their their work and their and their they did many things like they started a, a free clinic in East Los Angeles and they attempted to to do things that perhaps the brown beret men were not uh, doing and anyway they broke away and started a group called Las Adelitas and this photograph is of them marching in the moratorium in the rain and as you can see they're carrying crosses, which symbolize the the men that were killed in the Vietnam War, and um, and uh, the four women that are in there are became very well known as uh, representing the, the the Adelitas. I think uh, one of them was um, Hilda Reyes. She's the girl on the very far right, 
and then next to her was um, um, Gloria Arianes, I believe. And then the other two, I, I, her names, their names um, escape me at the moment, but not because, not because isn't, they're not important, but there's just so many names I deal with in, in my work yeah. that sometimes they escape me. But um, so that was that particular image, and that's become very famous. I mean, many of the Brownbury women use that as a, as a. Um, I mean, there's a lot of photographers, and every photographer ch chose to shoot different things, you know, different events, different, different women, different um, compositions. But that one has become kind of iconic, mm -hmm. as as many of my photographs have become. So uh, I'm very proud of that photograph. And um, anyway, uh, there was there's a couple other photographs from the moratorium in the rain. I have other photographs of the other um, uh, events, moratorium in the um, the regular moratorium where Ruben Salazar got killed, mm -hmm. and um, and there was another one that was before moratorium in the rain. But so I have documented a lot of people like, like um, Carlos Montes. He was one of the original organizers. And, and other, uh, um, uh, there was also an an artist, a very well known artist who helped organize it. Um, his name was um, I can't think of his name. I, I can see his his image, but he helped. <laughs> he painted a mural at UCLA mm -hmm. with three other artists, with Saul Solache. Oh, his name is Ramses Noriega, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Sergio Hernandez and Ed Carrillo, and they painted a very famous mural at UCLA, which was called, uh, oh, I don't, can't remember the name, but I was there documenting that too. And um, it has been very, it was the first mural painted in a university. So. Fantastic, Oscar. A, a lot of stories, and, and now at MOLA we have the honor to present your work in the group exhibition about Virgen de Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. And I would love if you can tell us a little more about the picture that you present at MOLA, uh, Cesar Chavez from 1972. Yes, well, that one was. Uh as a student, I had been, one of my classes was, it was called uh, um, community, uh, I forget, I'll come back to it, but anyway, I got to spend a semester, I chose the, the, the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee to write a paper on, so I got to, vi I would go and spend a day, you know, at, at their, a week at their, um, their community outreach office, and what they were doing is they were trying to get people in the community to support the farm workers to form a, a union, a labor union, to, to, uh, to do, they were requesting or demanding fair working conditions, salaries, and the, the, the prevention of use of pesticides because that causes cancer and that, you know, health issues. And even to this day, uh, uh, um, Dolores Huerta continues to do that. And of course, Cesar Chavez has passed away, but that particular year, they had a convention in, in Coachella. And myself and another friend, we, we took a, we drove out there because we wanted to be there. And, and I took my camera, of course, and I documented the, the, uh, the convention and the, you know, the farm workers that were there. And uh, this particular day, that, I noticed that they were using the Virgen de Guadalupe behind Cesar Chavez, and he continued to do that throughout his uh, his uh, years of, of organizing. But I think he chose it. I didn't ever ask him that, but I mean, it became obvious that he, he chose that because it was a symbol that the farm worker recognized and would more likely um, be likely to, you know, you have to have a certain amount of trust in somebody who's trying to, to to help you or to make changes. So Cesar Chavez used this as a, as a symbol of that, as a rallying point where he would take it on all the marches. And so uh, I positioned myself in an angle where I could get Cesar Chavez and in the background, I would get the image of the Virgen de Guadalupe. 
because I think that made a statement. It's kind of photojournalistic in a way, but it's art artistic. So like I say, I'd like to marry both of those styles because I mean, I wouldn't take a picture of Caesar here and then the Vivian Bolo over here, but, but <laughs> you have to position yourself to make a composition. So that I think that that shows my attempts to do that. And then another picture on that same roll of film, I have two rolls of film. I have two frames next to each other. And in one of them, it has Dolores Huerta with her son. Her son is standing over her shoulder and they're talking to each other. And in the back is another uh, political activist of the time, which was Corky Gonzalez from Colorado. And another very act, an activist, although he wasn't very well known, uh, Chapo, I forget his last name, but you see some figures here. And then in the next frame, you see Cesar Chavez, similar shot to that, but he's, he's talking to the, uh, you know, to, to the participants. So, but I always show that together. They're together, and you, you know, because it's 35 millimeter film, but it works together in, in a composition. And that's another thing that I do a lot of is compositions, as you'll see later on some of my work, because I think, <coughs> excuse me, an image can stand by itself, but I think if I enjoy doing compositions because it adds such a different dimension to it. So, yeah. but th that kind of answers your question about that particular image, right? Yes, yeah, so powerful. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, you have the opportunity to create an important series with Miguel Delgado, the very famous choreographer, Bailando por la Vida from 1985. Yes. Tell us a, a, about the story to work with uh, Miguel Delgado and this particular composition that you create. Well, I became, Miguel Delgado and I became friends because we were kind of run in the same circles of artists. And, and one day he asked me if I would take some pictures because I had a studio in Montebello because at the time I was doing some work for Cal State LA as a consultant. So I had a studio there where we designed uh, uh, books and we, you know, we did photographs. But he asked me to do a picture because he had so many costumes and he had an idea that he wanted to, me to photograph. So we met there one day and he brought, he brought uh, three different costumes. And I like it because it shows the, uh, you know, the concept of, of the Chicano and uh, starting with the, the Aztec costume and the Aztec culture. And then you show him, and the next one, there's a, him as a charro, because the charro is very important in the culture of, of, of the Mexican uh, history and culture, because the charro, of course, was originally um, have to do with cattle and, and working on a ranch. But during the Mexican Revolution, the charro was the soldier. So you see them all the time with their, with their sombrero. And of course, the charro is the mariachi. So, so it continues. And then, so we did a, a pose in either of those two, and then we also did a pose as a uh, okay uh, with Miguel with a with a with a girl dancer folklore, doing folklorico dancing, mm -hmm. and and then they pose for the camera very dramatically, so they're like coming right at the camera, and then the fourth one is uh, more contemporary, where they're dancing at a at a at a. Um, an event at the Los Angeles Convention Center where they're having a, a musical concert of various kinds of music. And at the time, I think Tierra was playing and Tierra is a very, very well-known band from rock, Chicano rock. And they were dancing, they were prevent, they had a dance, they were doing a choreography that, that went with, with certain music. So we were backstage and I was gonna take a picture. He says, wait, and he positioned his, there's other dancers there, and we did a nice, nice photograph. Uh, so and uh, and he he was a teacher too. He taught and at Plaza de la Raza in Lincoln Park, they they have a foundation for him that the Miguel Delgado Foundation, and so they continue his legacy. And um, and him as a teacher, teaching children, teaching young adults, and and teaching uh, adults. Yeah. And yeah, so he's a very, very, very powerful uh, choreographer and a part of history. So I like working with people like that, with many artists. Uh, but I chose that one particularly because he has so much 
you know, he just spends a, a, a breath of how many years? 500 years in, in, in costumes and in, and in culture. And Oscar, to finalize uh, this conversation, uh, I would like to know what is your secret to create this uh, important picture and historical picture at the same time. And if you can share with the new uh, generation of photographies some input uh, about your career and also your present as a, a very important photographer. Well, I, I think it's, it's a very hard question to answer, although basically I can say that I have a passion to do this. It's something that 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 is part of me and um, it's something I feel like I get up in the morning and I and I have to do it I have to do it you know I, as often as I can sometimes of course I you know I I do other things I I I have continued to to document the culture and the history of the Chicano but but I I also have I think John Noriega stated it very nicely in a in a bio he wrote of me that I have, I have, my work kind of reflects six different kinds of styles, so I can do, I can do very you know very cultural and and historical photographs, but I also like to go off and do landscapes and I do, and you know. And I, I I have a certain amount of freedom when I when I go and do, it's a kind of a therapy for me. I don't have to always do very political stuff, and and I I like to do still lifes. You know, I, sometimes I create still lifes here in the garden. I'll show you one over here later on. But I have still lifes that I create, and then to me they're like paintings. So I like to do them, and. Um, and anyway, there's none around here right now. <laughs> but but it's a passion, and, and in, in other words, if my work, if I were to give, a, I used to teach a photography class, mm. and um, I can encourage people to to not to. Of course, it's kind of a cliche, but to be yourself, you have to be. You have to look at your family. You have to know. You know, you, you can start there and then what is your passion? I mean, you can't go out and do something that you don't have any interest in. It has to be something dear to you and close to you. And then your your style or your the image will have more power and, you know, you will develop a, a style if that's, if that's what you should want. But um, I, I have many interests and many, uh, many images of different things. And sometimes I do stuff that, you know, they may reflect the Mexican culture or they may be almost Zen. I have a, a, a photograph I did and I like it because I call it Chicano Zen because it has a feeling to me of, of, of Zen, although I don't know that much about Zen, but I, I, I have a, I, I respect, you know, the, their, what, what little I know about it. And um, so, and I, you know, I like, uh, low rider cars so that's a culture or i like uh, working with artists murals you know uh, uh, dancers and models and you know uh, people men and women and singers and and, and musicians and uh, so there's so many things that that you can photograph that there's no end there's no end to what you can photograph i know many many people only do one thing over and over and over and over but i like to be different, do different things. Thank you, Oscar, mm -hmm. for your generosity, for sharing with all of us your knowledge and your passion of art. Thank you, it's a pleasure, and I'm, I'm glad you got to visit here and and enjoy the the sunshine and, your <laughs> and the pictures. fresh air and my, <laughs> my picture. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, thank you very much, Gabriela and staff.